Welcome to the Environmental Leadership Chronicles, a podcast brought to you by the California Association of Environmental Professionals. In this episode, we speak with Betty Dahoney with Dahoney Consulting. Betty has more than 40 years of experience conducting environmental studies for regulatory compliance and impact assessments throughout the United States. She specializes in managing complex, controversial projects while maintaining sensitivity to the potential for litigation, and she approaches each project with an eye to preventing a viable challenge under the environmental process. While focusing on infrastructure, she has delivered projects across various sectors, including water, transportation, resources, and federal government. Buddy has served as past president of the National Association of Environmental Professionals and is currently on the Legislative Review Committee for the California Association of Environmental Professionals. You'll hear more from Betty about her career path and experience. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, I'm Jessa. And I'm Laurel. And today's guest is Betty Dahoney. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, it's great to be here today. Let's start awesome. by you telling us how you're connected to AEP. I am a uh, very long-term member of the environmental profession, and I joined AEP, I can't even remember, I, I would think almost 30 years ago or more than 30 years ago, and been involved with AEP uh, a lot associated with their legislative review committee, been on that committee for about 20 years. It was initiated by an individual in the San Diego office, uh, San Diego uh, AEP uh, group, and got involved and initially started out trying to fix the initial study. And then went on uh, with a lot of other proposed uh, changes with legislation over, over the last 30 years. It's been a lot of fun. As well as AEP, I then uh, have been uh, involved in the National Association of Environmental Professionals as a member and presented at various conferences there also, and have served that organization as uh, president, uh, past president now, uh, vice president, and head of their uh, publications subcommittee. So been involved in the environmental professional, both on a national level and in the state of California for for, for a very long time. Wow. Yeah. So and are you so now you're still, you said, on the publication committee currently Mm -hmm. with NAEP? No, I'm I'm a member. I'm the past president now and on the board of directors. Uh, but my publication was one of my first tasks. Uh, oh, okay. To, uh, help try to get additional publication and visibility on both the technical side and more on the general side of a journal and newsletter, and also the other, I'll say, more written media that we were involved in. Got it. Thank you. And kind of, you know, stepping, I guess, back a little bit, can you tell us? I mean, this is probably expansive, but your career. So how did you get started? Where did you start? When did you first get interested in the environmental field? What triggered it and kind of like your first job? Oh, let's see. Uh, started out in undergrad and I was first generation. So didn't have a lot of guidance on how to navigate, uh, but I felt that it was very important to get a college education. So I went into that was very in, involved in science and kind of nerdy. So I got a degree in biology. And as an undergrad, I didn't really want to go and be an eighth grade science teacher. That just didn't have a lot of interest. And my family says, well, what are you going to do with that degree? The only thing you can, you know, the only thing you've le- learned is either to be a teacher or cut up frogs. And how can you get a career? And I'm sitting there going, you're right, I have no idea what to do with this degree. And then I got out of school in a recession and decided if I'm going to be poor and not have a really good job, I'm going to go back to school and grad. So I ended up in Arizona, uh, got my master's in aquatic environment, uh, aquatic invertebrate zoology. I was doing bugs in the aquatic system. Oh, you've been on one of those too. Oh, it's oh. great. 
so many copepods, nematodes. <laughs> oh, I, I did the a, a little bit larger though. Uh, mine were um, mayflies and dragonfly larvae and yeah. uh, fly larvae, which I could have done without, and some other neat stuff. But that would get really nerdy, and that one's usually an after five discussion. But uh, I got out and um, was kind of stymied because I'd relocated to um, Southern California because it was too cold and I was tired of snow. And I was up in Flagstaff. So that's why Arizona does have uh, a <clears throat> diverse weather pattern. Got involved uh, with uh, an engineering company that wanted somebody to do a bunch of ID work on aquatic macroinvertebrates from a project that they had collected a whole bunch of samples and had no one to identify them. And so that was my entry into environmental consulting, a master's degree that I didn't know what to do with now. And there was this NEPA thing that they had to do all these impact analyses. And this was a national company doing major infrastructure. So I started out in my previous life is what I call it as a biologist. Then I figured out the biologist had to be out in the cold and wet and 100 degrees and humid and bugs and not so much fun. And then I realized that when there's a recession, those guys get laid off and the project managers kind of stay around. So I became more of a generalist. So that's when I learned NEPA and CEQA. And then as a biologist, I could translate that stuff on the permitting, where most of our biologists didn't like to do the permitting. That's not fun. I, want, I wanted to be out in the field, not me. They did. So I became more as a generalist and then went through project management. And over time, um, went through several environmental consulting companies changed jobs in other areas, but it was the idea that there were different opportunities and I don't do well with boredom. As I've said, if you let me get bored, I'm going to cause trouble. So your best interest as a manager or supervisor of me is to make sure I don't get bored. And so if I started to get, you know, too many projects of the same type, and someone would, I'll say, wave a bright and shiny opportunity. Uh, I did shift uh, different, different companies and have had various roles, uh, project manager, senior project manager. Uh, I was the business group area manager for a bunch of hydrologists and solid waste engineers, as, for, as well as the environmental program. That one was an interesting one. I did learn that the idea of having my day job focused on looking at Excel sheets for utilization was not fun. And so I had an opportunity to, became, uh, to become a, a program manager of a large project that was $70 million in three years of revenues for a company. Uh, then I really got into something that was a lot more fun because I moved away out of the operational and became a technical resource for the entire United States for a national engineering company. They also had some international work also. So I was able to provide technical leadership throughout the company, provided business development opportunities, uh, was problem solver, which is really great for a troublemaker like me, is to be paid to go into some place and create a solution. And so in the meantime, getting involved with a lot of young professionals and giving them the opportunity to see, you know, what kind of opportunities there are out there for environmental professionals. So had a, have had a lot of fun. Caused a lot of trouble over the over the decades. I love that. That it's very exciting to hear a fellow troublemaker because because <sighs> it's um, being a generalist is really fun because you get to dabble in all sorts of different areas and then you can kind of be this walking library for people. You can just be this resource where people are like, oh, 
uh, you know, do I need a hydrologist on this project and why? I bet Betty knows. Do I need um, e- an ecological restoration e- or a restoration ecologist? I bet Betty would know. Do I need a water specialist? I bet Betty would know. And I, I can just from listening to you thinking about you sort of amassing all of the expertise and being this this outstanding resource. And that serves you well, I'm sure, being a leader in in, in AEP. What, um, how do you, how do you use your technical resource skills to support the profession at large, not just in one company, but overall through NAEP? Oh, getting the leadership of the uh, environmental professionals uh, during the, uh, we have a lot of webinars, we have training and we have uh, the conferences and trying to identify those challenges that we are coming into. And environmental justice is a new one, quote unquote, and looking at that and getting ahead of the game, so to speak, and trying to identify those resources and pull them from either competitors that have worked on project, uh, people that you know technically. And the the resources out there, it's a it's a seems like it's a small community. And being able to call somebody up and having that and just saying, hey, I'm looking for an economist who does agriculture and social impacts. There's not a lot of them out there. I made one. Actually, it was an email. Hey, do you know somebody? They called me up and gave me three names. And making that network you know, from a national level and bringing it. Sometimes we don't have them in California that have that type of technical area. Quite frankly, we do a lot more exporting. I'll tell you, quite frankly, from California to nationally. I've used so many resources when I've been on projects in other parts of the the U.S. in which I've, I've picked up folks from the California market because they had you know, the, the complexity, the controversy of California projects are um, a little bit sometimes more than what you see in other areas. And having those technical resources is a great opportunity. Agreed. I think I think we all can agree that if you can handle permitting and technical development uh, requirements in California, you should be all right in other places. <laughs> you should be able to take care of it. Um, I remember you mentioning to me when I asked you to help me on my project, I did the same thing that you're talking about. I was like, I have a problem. I'm calling someone in AEP and they're like, talk to Betty. So I called <laughs> Betty and you know, you, you and I had just like a quick, quick chat about it. And I was like, okay, this is, this is why I love being a part of AEP and NAEP is because I'm just at my disposal a phone call away is somebody with a brilliant different perspective and idea that that I couldn't possibly come up with on my own. So thank you. And when we were chatting, you mentioned about being a liaison to the Biden administration. Is yes. that walk me through that? Because that sounds okay. really awesome. NAEP uh, is very involved in education and also looking at regulatory changes and how it affects the environmental professional, because we are responsible, as is AEP, of disseminating information so that the practitioners, whether you're a government agency employee or whether you're a consultant or whatever else is out there, we need to make sure as an organization that we provide that information to the practitioners so that they can do their job. And that's really important. So as you've tracked or heard in the last year before the Biden administration had come in, there were massive changes in NEPA, uh, the Army Corps, migratory bird treaty issues, all of these regulations. And we were just massively trying to track where they were going, what was happening. And so we had to, uh, we have different practice groups in in AEP and one is NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act. We have biology, we have cultural resources, we have environmental justice, we have transportation, we're mobilizing a renewable uh, practice group and focusing on wind, 
um, climate change. So we all have all these independent little practice groups and there's some overlap, like I belong to all of them. Um, and so they are looking at what is happening. So we have uh, NAEP, when I speak of that, um, we have presented uh, response papers to proposed legislation changes that the Trump administration had proposed or had, um, had worked with. And we also uh, worked with the Council on Environmental Quality. So if I, I do my jargony thing, which I have to do just to, uh, uh, it, when I say CEQ, that is the equivalent to the Office of Planning and Research, OPR, that California has. And so this is a pretty big deal. This is the national, you know, big leader. Of it's the what, White House. Yeah, White House Council on Environmental Quality. Yes. And so we've worked with uh, with uh, the Council on Environmental Quality, the staff level, quite f- frequently over the years. And what happened was we had been contacted by the admi- administration transition team before Biden came into office. And they said, we would like NAEP's perspective on in, uh, NEPA and the changes that had been implemented by Um, the Trump administration. They wanted the information in less than 10 days. We're in COVID, which has actually turned out to be probably a positive because we had access to all of the changes that we've dealt with on Zoom meetings, uh, the uh, Google Docs, we, you know, changed because we weren't all in the same company. So we had no internal network that we could (laughs) edit reports and be changing them. We had uh, six people on this team. I took the biotech lead, the NEPA uh, practice uh, group lead, the EJ uh, practice group lead, Coastal, and me. And in 10 days, we had a 26-page white paper that NAEP had generated on unintended consequences associated with the changes, and there were various ones. Uh, The issues of how implementable those practices were and how hard it was going to be, whether they met the ultimate mission of NEPA. We're not proposing things from a perspective of we we want this because we want to protect this. It was, this is the law that's in effect and does this meet the mission or the expectation of that law? So we're not we're not generating anything that's that's going outside of the bounds. And uh, so we had several conference calls with the transition team. And then when the new administration came in, they had a an entirely new uh, CEQ staff. And so we presented the same information and we are continuing to work with CEQ in that aspect. But through this relationship with both the past CEQ staff and the new CEQ staff, uh, we have expanded our relationship with CEQ, which is something that's important to me is that we really need as a profession, in my opinion, which does not represent necessarily in in uh, NAEP or AEP, so let me make sure we understand, this is my opinion, is that the environmental professionals do need to expand our uh, credibility and reputation with other people outside. And as a result of that, at this point, I was the president of NAEP, and I talked to the staff level at CEQ, and I said, I'd really like to invite Um, uh, your new appointed from the president head of CEQ, uh, so she's a political appointee, to be one of our speakers at the conference that we're going to be held. They said, go for it. So they, they, they had no problems with it. So I reached out and it's uh, Ms. Brenda Brenda Mallory is the new Council on Environmental Quality head of uh, CEQ. 
and we invited her to the the conference. So she went back, and this is she's not talking to me individually. She's going back through her staff, that which is fine. That's you know it's appropriate. Staff says, okay, we need some information. How large is the organization? And, you know, what are you doing? And who are you really? And stuff like that. <laughs> so we, we present that information. Well, this is just, I'm going to say days after her appointment. And um, I may be exaggerating. So, you know, um, but we're the first organization that has invited her to be a guest speaker. So she Ooh. has to run this up the flagpole to get approved. She doesn't have you know, oh, yeah, I can do that, anything I want. So um, long story short, she agreed to be one of our, our speakers at the conference. So um, we have an executive director, and it's all on a Zoom conference. It's it's remote. And so we she's agreed to do it. We make sure that she understands what, what's going on. And our executive director gets a call from the White House saying, we need to have the logistics on your login. We have to have all this other stuff. I get a call from the executive truck. I just talked to the White House. <laughs> Love it. Wow. I, was thinking, I was like, I would have freaked out. Oh, yeah. It's cool. She's it's like, cool. <laughs> it, it, it was great. And uh, so we, we created um, uh, uh, just um, a program or, or a system because I felt that it was very important for various people of any EP to be exposed and also to be part of this, this opportunity to get um, the um, head of CEQ uh, to be a speaker. So um, I had the head of uh, the um, NEPA practice group, Chuck Nicholson, and the incoming president who we transitioned during the conference to a new president. Uh, Ron Espelacy and myself were the three that introduced uh, Brenda Mallory. Now, the adrenaline rush is there. Trust me, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, you know, um, and how many, you know, committee meetings, council, you know, and all these other things that you can go through. And yes, I did have an adrenaline rush. Uh, Ms. Mallory came on and we're all on Zoom. We did the introductions and stuff like that. She's just, this is my first presentation from the White House. And the room that I'm in is next door to where they have the press conferences and things like that. And it's got the flag. It's got the podium with the White House seal on it. And we're having this one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, just chit-chatting until she comes on and does her presentation. And then um, we had Chuck do an introduction to questions that we had. And then we had Rana do the, the wrap up so that, that all of our, uh, it wasn't all of our leadership, but some of the key leaders in, in, the, in the environment on, in NEPA were uh, involved. It was absolutely great. I, I talked to uh, our executive director just recently. She says, gosh, it's been a, uh, a, an amazing year. And I said, well, what was your, your best one? She said, the White House. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's amazing. What a big was a lot of fun. win and connection and relationship now to have and to develop. And when you were saying this in about the Biden administration reaching out, is that common for a White House administration to reach out to NAP or is that, I don't want to say we unprecedented, but is that common? Not from the political level, uh, but, but OPR frequently will call AEP and I say call, you know, send an email, pick up the phone and say, we're, we're doing this. And just a heads up, something's happening. Uh, we have had a long-term re relationship with the staff level of OPR, and we, we you know, encourage that. We have them as um, they present sessions at, at our uh, conference, and they also do, a, uh, they participate in a, a webinar typically of what's happening this year on NEPA. I'm sorry, what does that, can you, uh, what does that stand for? Which one was uh, it? The Governor's uh, Office of Planning oh, and Office Research. of Planning and Research. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the California Governor's Office of Planning Research that that implements overseas 
CEQA with the California Natural Resources Agency secretary. And it's like the C- the, the state equivalent of the White House CEQ. Thank you. And like, and I, and I'll chime in because AEP is so engaged and so involved in Sacramento. We've got our lobbyists. Um, anytime new legislators come in, we brief them on like, these these bills could or could not affect CEQA. They may make this more difficult for you. These could be the unintended consequences of, of these actions. And what we hear is most oftentimes legislators that come in are like, what is CEQA? What? And we're the, we're the as Betty is saying, is like AEP are the go-to explainers, the resources. Well, and so I guess what I, is that then new with the CEQ? Is that the, a new relationship? We're expanding our uh, involvement with CEQ and to a higher political level than we had before. And that's one of the important things that I had really wanted to do as the president of NAEP. And then also my involvement in the legislative review committee with AEP. There's a there's a, you know, a, a similarity between that. And it, it's all been associated with the fact that I felt that many times the environmental professionals are not really respected for what we're doing, that we are scientists. Some of us are engineers, some of us are are planners, but all of these are, are technical experts in a certain field. And I'm going to say something that may sound negative, but Many times our environmental professionals may be seen as what I call checklist monkeys. You, 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 you know, yes or no. And I've even had some of my engineers go, well, you can't say that. My client's not going to like that. And I said, but you're going to affect a wetland. I have to check yet. No, move it. And I've, I've actually had one that changed the checklist after it had been done and submitted it. So the profession is not as respected as I see that that the engineering profession is. When you go into, you know, um, a political interest, you'll see things come out of the National Congress that says the Engineering Society said we have a C in in roadways or a D in dams or or this type of thing. We need to get the infrastructure bill done. Well, you don't see that same relevancy on the environmental aspect and the fact that we are scientists and we are planners and we are um, uh, engineers also, and we need to provide the data for making informed decision-making. And I don't think that the profession is visible enough. We're often perceived as being more advocating for environment above everything. Well, you know, what's often called the tree huggers. And, you know, I'm not saying that many of us in the profession are not very environmentally conscious, but our day job is really to provide data collection, data interpretation, and presentation of that information for decision makers, whether they're regulators or whether they're the political decision makers to make informed decision. And my opinion is as environmental professionals, we should not be biasing our data. We should be very credible. We should be correct. We should provide assumptions as to what is out there and how, you know, how much information did go in to make this decision and what are the risks of those decision making. And so getting this exposure to more of the politics or the political interests in the national level and getting that visibility is hopefully going to help us as a profession that when we stand up in a council meeting, that we garner the same amount of respect as if an engineer stands up, they go, wow, yeah, uh uh-huh. And if I call myself an environmental professional, they go, oh yeah, tree hugger. No, I'm paid for my opinion. 
Well, no, what I'm wondering is you're talking about this contrast between engineers and environmental professionals. One thing that comes to mind is licensure. And so environment or excuse me, engineers, there's a license and you know their career reputation is at risk if they stamp something or send something out that is inaccurate. And that's something I've heard on the other side of, you know, for an environmental professional, there's there are some certifications you can get, like professional wetland expert, but there's not really that overarching license. And so I'm wondering if you think that has anything to do with it, the level of respect and or um, what your opinion is on some kind of general license for the field. Okay. Full disclosure. Uh, there is actually a program for more generally generalist environmental professionals, and it is the Academy of Board Certified Environmental Professionals. And the certification is CEP, Certified Environmental Professional. And my full disclosure is I'm on the board of trustees for CEP, for ABSEP, Jargon Academy Board of Certified Environmental Professionals that I don't want to repeat. Um, And that I've actually sat on their certification board. Uh, for many years until I became a board of trustee member. And then I had to give up my reviewing applications for certification. Uh, It is not as well known because since I do not have to sign a plan, which an engineer does, then many organizations don't want to pay for you to become certified because it's an annual requirement for you to um, pay money to maintain your certification. You have continuing education requirements and very few entities require the certification. There are a few organizations that uh, do require you to be either a CEP or there's another one that is not environmental focused, the uh, prof- uh, Um, uh, Professional Project Manager, uh, PMP, which is another certification that I have. But um, the certification of environmental professionals is a bit of a challenging issue because how do you test? And we have something on the level of over 20 technical topical areas that are under what I'll call the umbrella of the California Environmental Quality Act or the National Environmental Policy Act. And if you're a biologist, you may not know anything about cultural resources or air quality. So how do we generate a a test to address your competency that's going to be universal for professionals? Uh, The PEs are done by state and they they have something, you know, fairly straightforward from the engineering perspective, the, the, you know, the the methodology and those things for them to be tested on. So it is a little bit difficult under um, the CEP. We have hazardous waste people who are, are CEPs. We have sociologists who are CEPs. We have academicians. We have Um, water uh, treatment plant operators who are CEPs. So it's it's a really challenging thing. The professional wetland is a very small niche in the overall uh, aspect. Um, To a certain extent, I will disclose that I did get my CEP because I was working for an engineering company. And although it didn't make a difference necessarily when I was proposing on projects or business development, when I I said, well, wait a second, I'm certified also in the engineering company, they they kind of said, oh, okay, then I maybe will listen to you. Yeah. It's sometimes it's been helpful in my career to say that I'm project management certified and in an engineering firm. So mm-hmm. I know how to like manage projects to those types of engineering specifications while I'm not an engineer and I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I can't just, I'm just not, um, I don't get it, but I, I think it's an, it's an excellent 
topic. And we talk about this in AEP and AEP and in our profession often, because I do think it would be helpful um, to add some clout and earn some respect. Um, but I, as you, as Betty mentioned, in my, in my opinion, it seems pretty burdensome. It's hard to be an all encompassing certified professional and an environmental professional encompasses, in my opinion, everything, all the things, everything you possibly think of is environmental in my opinion. So thank you for walking us through that, Betty. I'm sure it's, it's something that has it changed over time, like in your 30 some odd years mm-hmm. of being in the industry, has it has the CEP, CEP um, community grown or is it steady? This, uh, the CEP program has grown and I would like to encourage people in California to consider it mm-hmm. because one of the things they see is, well, wait a second, that's a national thing. I don't do NEPA. I only do CEQA or I only do archaeology in in California. However, the certification process for CEP is an essay based and it allows you to pick the topical area that you are proficient in. There's one for planning, more or less. There's one for biology. There's one for hazards. And it asks you to discuss how would you approach a project with sensitive biological resources. Mm. And it's not state specific, it's not regional specific, it's you could be a fish person, you could be a terrestrial person or whatever. And then a similar worded question for, you have a contaminated site, what would you do? And Mm. so it's more looking at it as a process. So even though it sounds like it's a national and it's talking NEPA, it's it talks about the environmental regulations in CEQA and addressing those would be, you know, when I got mine, I was, I was 90% CEQA and not NEPA. And I was working for a state only organization, um, engineering company. So I can tell you that, you know, that there is no issue with passing the CEP as a state of California uh, professional. Mm-hmm. Thank you. What you said too, or yeah, thank you. Sorry for explaining that. And, and when you were saying about, you know, issues with credibility in the field and just being able to say, like you said, in that example, in the room full of engineers, like I, I am a certified professional, just being able to say that and like, add like the credibility level, of, like I'm a scientist, like I, this is non-biased. This is based on the policies. Like, I just think that is another reason to get it, even if it's not CEQA based. Um, and with with engineering companies, it does help that because uh, I belong to an organization that had two professional tracks, technical and operational. And so you could become like a senior BP, but they also had a similar tract of a principal pro- a professional associate. And you had to be meeting criteria of advanced registration. Okay. If you're an environmental professional, I don't have a PE, but when uh, I did receive the um, the professional um, principal professional associate in this organization because I had my CEP, I had my PMP, and my I had another certification for Envision uh, specialist, Um, and as a result of that, I checked the boxes with all of that aspect. And was um, actually the first and only woman environmental professional that had reached that level in a company that had 10,000 employees. So uh, congratulations. (laughs) It took a bit. (laughs) Well, Betty, this is wonderful. We're about out of time. I just want to thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I love that you basically started with your love of bugs and bunnies, if you will, and have expanded. Now you're at the White House and talking about, you know, advising on policy and just all the the different opportunities that you can create for yourself within this field when you're when you're open to them and you start to look for them. Um, so thank you. And we will now get into our wrap up rapid five. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, what is your favorite daily habit? Walking. 
you know, you got to do that to get stress relief and just, you know, get away from the house because working from home is kind of hard to have a long commute where usually you had that download time and it's like, yeah, take a walk. Great. Uh, what are three things you take to a deserted island? Mm-hmm. Uh, books. A uh, large number of diverse teas. And my beer making kit. I love it. <laughs> oh, what is your favorite environmental policy? Actually, it is the uh, California Environmental Quality Act. It's performance driven. Uh, it's not as weird as NEPA with non-performance and thresholds and requirements for mitigation. So yeah, I'm a CEQA person. Right. And what is your favorite fauna or flora? Dragonfly. Ooh. One of my aquatic inverts. Not the, what was it? The fly larva? Yeah. Um. <laughs> no, they, they, they weren't that, but the, the dragonfly, um, I geocache also, and you're supposed to have a little name and I'm dragonfly lady one. So Aww. yeah, it's a, <laughs> I love it. Okay. And finish this sentence. Wouldn't it be cool if, Oh, I'm going to be mean. You can cut me off, but I'm going to give you three. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if people actually thought before they spoke or posted things and really decided whether it was going to provide a benefit or whether it's just negative. Second one is, wouldn't it be cool if people were promoted or recognized based upon qualifications and not who their buddies with? And the third is actually the most important one and just a particular annoyance to me right now. And that is, wouldn't it be cool if decisions were made based upon data? and not rhetoric. So if you want to cut that, you're quite welcome to do that, but you oh, gave me. Thank mind. you. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> We're keeping it dragonfly lady. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forgot. I also home brew if you haven't figured out and I've informally named my brewing as dragonfly lady brews. <laughs> Beautiful. Love We're going to come sample. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Thank you so much, Betty. It was wonderful. Oh, it was great seeing you all today and and hope everything's great. We hope you enjoyed this episode. As a new podcast, it really helps us if you share with friends and colleagues that may enjoy this podcast as well. And please subscribe or follow the podcast to be alerted for new episodes. Also, if you want to submit a shout out, please send a voice memo under a minute, uh, ideally to podcast with an S at... C-A-L-I-F-A-E-P dot org. Again, that's podcast at C-A-L-I-F-A-E-P dot org or any feedback that you'd like to share. We love feedback. Thank you.